The scripture reading today will be from Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 through 38. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Thank you, Jared. It's good to see everybody today. Thank you, Joshua, for last week. Very good job. I appreciate you sharing about families and what families are here and uh, how you're trying to work with those. Uh, they're going to be preaching on the fifth Sunday, so I, th- I need to give them a little bit of time to be able to speak to you because they have a lot of good things to say as well, and uh, you're going to get tired of me, so uh, let me give them a chance to be able to speak and say some things, so uh, just so you know, that's, that's going to be coming up. Um, one of the things we've been doing lately is on evangelism on sharing the heart of God and what that really means to us and so there's a game today how many of you knew there was a game today okay some of you did and you're probably gonna watch maybe not go but you're gonna watch right so my question this morning is did you share more about football this week than you did about Jesus You know people are going to argue with you if you share about football. You know they're going to think you're wrong. If you pick a team and tell somebody, this is the team that's going to win, people are going to be upset at you. They're going to be mad at you. What do you mean? They're not going to win. They're no good. So why do we do that with Jesus? Well, because football is impersonal. Uh, There's another game next week. Well, not next week, but next year. I mean, and we'll do the whole thing again, and we'll all argue about it. We're used to arguing about it, and we always argue about it because our team is never the same as their team, and our team is always better, win or lose, right? And so uh, that's what we want to do. We want to be able to share like that. It's not personal. I think there's an interesting phenomenon that is happening with social media and the fact that we tend to share a lot of things. We don't share just a few things we do. We share a lot of things. And we share the mistakes we make. We share all kinds of stuff. We share stuff we shouldn't be sharing even. Almost to the point where we don't have a personal life. There's nothing that we hold refrain from sharing. And so it's almost like there isn't anything personal anymore. No, we just dump it all out there and, well, here you are. And So there isn't anything personal that we really have to share. And I wonder if that makes an impact on whether we would share something that is important to us or not. Because I think that's really what it comes down to. We're going to share what we're excited about. We're going to share what's important to us. And so with that kind of thinking, what is it that makes us want to share? And I think the passage that we're going to look at today talks a lot about this that Jared has read to us. Jesus is going through the cities and villages and he has been teaching, he has been healing. He has healed Jairus' daughter. He has healed the woman with the, who's basically on her period for 12 years. He has healed the two blind men. And so he has been healing and there's three examples that are given right before this passage. And so this kind of is the summary of all of that. He's healed the, the mute demon-possessed man as well. And then he comes to this passage as he's teaching and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and healing every affliction. What is it that makes Jesus want to share? And I think that's where we're left with with this passage. What makes Jesus want to share is they're so helpless. We don't seem to know what we're doing. And he looks at the people around and he says, they don't even know how to live. They don't get it. They don't understand what life is even about. He says, they're like sheep without a shepherd. They're harassed. They're helpless. They seem kind of pitiful. 
And, and so they don't really seem to understand. The best thing I can come up with is maybe they feel like a lost child. And if you see a child that's lost, you want to make sure that that child's going to get with his parents, going to be found, because what happens? Well, besides the screaming that goes on when he realizes mom isn't there, but it's that horrible feeling of, I, I'm lost. I don't have anywhere to go. I don't belong here. I don't know where I belong. There's no one that cares about me. And, and I don't have any place. I don't have any way to deal with things. And we have a lot of compassion for that. And I think that's how Jesus sees us, like a child that can't find its way. It needs to be rescued. And it's interesting what his solution is. His solution is pray. Okay, what do you mean by that? He says, pray for the Lord of harvest to send out workers into his harvest. Well, Jesus, you've been training disciples just for that task. I mean, you called them exactly for that task. You told them, you will become fishers of men. I will make you fishers of men. That's why you're here. Because you're going to be doing that task. Why didn't he say, there is the harvest, let's get busy. There is the harvest, we should go. There is the harvest, that's what you're here for. He tells them, pray that the Lord will send workers into the harvest. Because this whole thing has always been God controlled. It is not up to us. And somehow we get the idea that we're going to be the ones that go save everybody. In fact, if you look at the example of Jesus and look at what he did, when did Jesus ever come out and say, I'm the Savior of the world, you guys listen to me. Everybody ought to pay attention because I'm it. I'm the guy. I'm the Savior. He doesn't do that. Why not? He says, I'm the one sent from the Father. It's John 3.16. God so loved the world that he sent. That's the way it's supposed to work. And so he says, pray for the Lord to send people into his harvest. It's not up to just run out there and go and say, I'm it. I'm the Savior. I'm the one who's going to save all of you. And he says, no, pray for God to send. Because when God sends, you get things like Pentecost. When God sends, you get things like a cross. But when God sends, you get God's work being done God's way. It's always been a God operation. And then it works. And then things are effective. And we wonder why they're not sometimes. And I think maybe it's because we didn't pray for God to send. We just decided, we'll go save him for you, God. That's never in there. He says, you wait till I send you. And he turns the disciples loose to go preach what he's been preaching. But it's only until the Spirit sends that you really see all this. Ultimately, it's about healing the worst disease. Jesus has talked about healing here. And so he's talked about healing blindness. He's talked about uh, healing Jairus' daughter. He's talked about demon possession. But ultimately, it's about healing sin and about healing the devil's influence. And Jesus goes so that he can heal, and that's what he's all about. He sees the cross, and he prays for God to send, because that's exactly where he is. I am being sent by God into this world for you. And he knows his mission. He knows his place. It's not just his own doing. God is sending him. And so we see that as a huge thing. And so what are some of the reasons that we might want to share? I think maybe there's fewer people that share these days. And as Jesus goes, he heals. He doesn't give up on people. But what are some of the reasons that we would share some things? Well, I've made a list for you. The times when we share, first of all, we share if we're excited. So if somebody gets a new car, what's the first thing you say? I got a new car. Let me come and see it. Right? Isn't that how the exchange goes? Because you're excited for them because they got the new car. 
And so you want to ride in it. You want to see it. You want to see what color it is. You want to see how many horsepower it's got. You want to see all kinds of stuff. But nobody comes in and says, I've got a three-year-old car. <laughs> it's dirty. It needs to be washed. You want to come and see it? We don't do that. Why not? I don't know. We're not excited about it anymore. It isn't new anymore. We share what we're excited about. Now we might say, I've got a car that's got 287,000 miles on it. Okay, I want to see that car. You know, that might be exciting a little bit, but you know, we just... So the newness or the excitement, I think, is a lot of the reason that we're going to share. We think, we share when we think it will be appreciated. And so if we have something that we can give to someone that's going to be really appreciated, we don't mind sharing that. Uh, if you bought your kids tickets to Disney and said, we're going to go and spend a week, would they be excited? Well, chances are they'd be really excited and melt down and just go, wow, this is great, this is wonderful. And you realize it's their birthday or Christmas and all you got them was, you know, slips of paper. They don't have anything. But they know what's coming, and so they're excited about that. It's going to be appreciated, and so that's the reason you spent this incredible amount of money on just slips of paper. And they're going to give you the response that, that you wanted. You share because it'll be appreciated. We also share when we think we can make an immediate, tangible difference. We want to fix something for someone, and we want it to happen now. And so there may be something that you're able to fix when it's easy to do. One of the reasons that people want to go on mission trips, I think, is because they can make a difference right now. You're going to go spend an entire week in another country like El Salvador and go and try and teach people, care for people, do something with them that will make a, a difference in their life. Well, so how about this week? Can you do something? Wow, man, the schedule's kind of tight. It's kind of busy, isn't it? But it's the same amount of time. But we'll think if we go overseas, we can share there. Why doesn't that mean we can share here? Well, no, overseas we can do it because we're away. We're over. Really? Well, it's the same as the car. When you've got that much time dedicated to it, then you feel like you can make an immediate tangible difference in the person that you've met right in front of you. Number four is we share when it isn't too complicated. I want to share if it's easy. If I can give you a few bucks, that'll fix it. If I can give you advice, it'll fix it. Uh, if there's something we can do, do you need a ride, do you need... Whatever it is that we can do that doesn't take too much time, okay? But if I'm going to give you advice and then you're going to ask me a whole bunch of questions about it, then, ah, this is taking too long. You know, I just want to be able to say one thing and, and then it fixes it. And so that's the kind of thing that we want to share. And if it's going to get really complicated or involved, we tend to not do that quite so much because, after all, that's going to make it take a whole lot of time. And so... We tend to shy away from those things. What happens to our excitement if we think it isn't going to be appreciated? Well, it kind of goes down a lot. Or it doesn't make a difference, or at least it doesn't make a difference we can see. Or we get ignored, or we get pushed aside, or we get attacked even for being good or for sharing our faith or something like that. Well, then that tends to put a damper on that. So can we change any of those things? Not really. We can't do anything about how complex our world gets, and it's not going to be fixed immediately. There isn't a single person around you that you can just say something to. You can say Jesus to, and it'll fix their life. It's a lot more complicated than that, and so we tend to not want to do it as much. We can't change the cold shoulder we get when we mention Jesus. We can't change the fact that it's not an instant measurable difference or anything. And so the one thing that we can control is about how excited we are for God. 
We can't change any of their reaction. We can only change our reaction. And so maybe you ought to be excited about the 10-year-old car that you've got. I've got a car that's 10 years old, and it needs washing. <laughs> maybe that's what we need to still be excited about. It still rolls. Uh, it's still good, and we're able to use it. But we can be excited about God, about what he's doing in our life, about what we see in other things, about what's going on around us. And I think that's one of the things that happens for us. Don't let anything spoil your excitement about what you genuinely have, as if you needed something better or new. Jesus is always new and fresh and doing things around you in your life. And you can see the result of what he does in your life. So why do people respond on the other side? That was why you share. Now, why would people respond? Well, Tim Keller wrote a book called Center Christian and, excuse me, Center Church, and he writes about some different things that happen. Here's his top reasons that people will come to Jesus, okay? The first one is they'll come out of fear of judgment and death. Well, they don't come in order to be judged and die, right? They come because of the excitement. They come because they can get past the fear of judgment and death, that they will no longer be judged, that they will no longer have death. And so there's an excitement that goes with that. There's an excitement about how we escape something that we once thought was an imminent problem that was going to just destroy us. Some people think they're just lost causes, and so they may not go at all. But a lot of the reason people do respond is because they realize they're lost, and they realize that God can make a difference, and so they're excited about that. The second one is we come to God to release burdens and guilt and shame, exactly what Dallas was talking about. And I, I agree that we've kind of done away with shame, haven't we? You don't need to be ashamed of anything because we're all just terrible. Doesn't that make it feel better? You're just like me and I'm just like you and we're all terrible, so it's okay. We have nothing to be ashamed about. But what if you had something better? What if you had somebody who could release and forgive and get rid of shame? Where you could breathe for once. And that weight is gone because you've been trapped and you've been imprisoned by the fact that you know you're guilty. And the fact that everybody else is too doesn't really fix it, does it? It doesn't really make that much of a difference. Number three is they come to God for appreciation of truth and direction. They have too many questions, and they don't feel like they get enough answers, and they're excited because you aren't lost anymore, you're found, because there seems to be some direction in your life, and there's a right spot, and, and it really feels good to be going the right direction. You ever, have you ever really been lost? I know people think I get lost all the time when I go on hikes, but I don't. I know I'm just not on the right path. There's a difference between lost and knowing you're not on the right path. I've kind of had both, but it's been a long time since I've really been lost and standing around going, I have no clue which direction to go to walk out of here. After that, I learned to pay attention. Where are the mountains? Are they on your right or are they on your left when you started? You better, you know, kind of get a compass reading or something like that. But when you get to this idea that this is what's really the right direction to go. I mean, feeling completely lost, like you have nothing, no direction, nowhere is one horrible feeling, but it's just as bad to realize, you know, I'm not where I should be. And if you can get on that right path, it does make you feel better. It does make things make sense in your life. And it's, it's that assurance that everything's going to be okay. The fourth one is that we come because of meaning purpose, fulfillment. We want to find some kind of significance in this world. And so it's his adoption that 
makes sense to us, his meaning and fulfillment, that we are here on earth for him. We are to live with him, and he brought us here, and we are able to change our life. We are able to live for him, and he's taking us to a heavenly home. And that's the reason we're here. We're not just here to live and die. And so many people have come to the fact that, well, they don't, I can't believe in God because he won't let me live like I want to. Well, you still don't have any purpose then. I'm just here to die. The faster you get it done, the better, right? No. Because hopefully you'll realize there is a purpose. There is a real meaning. We come to God for help with a problem. We have something we can't get past. And you realize you don't have anybody to talk to. And there's this great sense of need and you don't know how to deal with it. And finally... Somebody says, there is somebody you can talk to who has all the answers, and that's God. And so we might come because we need that, because no one else has been able to fix us. The last one is we come to be loved, because God does love. And that is so attractive. And maybe it gets twisted a little bit because we want to just say, well, God loves everybody. God loves anyone. God loves everything. You don't have to worry about your shame or your guilt or anything. Just, But God does love. Well, and he does expect obedience and he does expect us to do things that are right and put ourselves on the right path and to find purpose and fulfillment and direction so that we're able to be free from that judgment and death. And he does love us to be able to accomplish all of those things. And so which way do you want to share? Do you like carrots or sticks? You can read the list either way, can't you? Like you don't want to have this fear of judgment and death or, boy, you're just as lost as you can be. And you know you're going to die and everybody's going to judge you. Everybody thinks you're wrong, including God. Which one's more attractive to you? Which one would you respond to, whether it's attractive or not? Do you respond because somebody tells you something negative? Do you respond because somebody gives you a positive choice? It's probably a combination of both, didn't you think? Because both are actually true. And I think we see Jesus using both at times. But which one makes people respond better? So are you still excited? I don't think sharing faith is easy. But we don't share faith because it's easy. That's not why we do it. We share faith because we love God. And there was once a moment when we were deaf and blind and lost and desperate and purposeless and searching for truth and he showed us how to have it and we got found we got adopted we were loved we were like lost children and we really didn't know where we were going or where better was and now we're washed and now we're clean and we remember when we first rejoiced and we felt that and if you can remember the first time you were cleansed, when your sins were washed away, can you remember that time? Can you remember when you were first baptized into Christ and what that day felt like? And every time you see somebody else go through it, you see that same expression on their face. Why isn't it still there? Because I've got a 50-year-old salvation. I mean, it happened a long time ago, right? Doesn't that make you more excited about it? Because I think it kind of gets shinier as it goes, unlike the car. It kind of gets better as you go, and more blessings come as you go. I think that's what we need to remember most, is why we ever rejoiced in the first place. So let me share one other passage with you that I think may set the tone for where we are in all of this. And it's kind of an unusual one. It's Jesus washing feet in the upper room the last night before his crucifixion. And I really think this passage has a lot to do with us and the reason why we would share. It says, 
Then he poured water into a basin and he began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel that was wrapped around him. And he came to Simon and Peter who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? And Jesus answered him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. And Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. And Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, The one who is bathed does not need to wash except his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was to betray him, and that was why he said, Not all of you are clean. This passage has bothered me for a long time. Because you realize there's things in there that I just don't quite get. Sure, it's about washing feet, and it's not about washing feet, right? Because he's not telling them, I want you to carry a basin of water and just find somebody who will take their shoes off. Wash their shoes if they won't do that. I mean, that, that's not what he's trying to say with this. And so while it is about washing feet and service, it's not really about washing feet. And it is about them being clean and washing to be clean because he's washing the feet that are dirty. And it is about service. And so is this spiritual? Is it literal? We recognize there are times when we need to be washed. Okay? When we've been dirty before. And maybe that's a time when, when we repent of our sins, we're baptized into Christ, and we're washed, we're clean, we're holy. We've, there are times for that. And this seems to be an odd one. Jesus even says, you won't understand. Now when Jesus already says, you won't understand, you're not going to understand. And he's going to explain it. So let me see if I can't give this a little bit of definition for us. He is making them clean. Is it spiritual or literal? Well, there is a parallel, isn't there? It might be both. He does refer to Jesus, uh, uh, Judas, as not all of you are clean. And it doesn't matter how much he's going to wash Judas' feet, not all of you are clean. Okay? Because there's a plot to betray him. And he comes to Peter, and Peter has, I don't know what it is. Is it a reverence for Christ that he says, no, I'm not good enough for you to wash my feet? Or is it shame about them? But he's got dirty feet. And he says, you'll never wash my feet. Why? Well, they don't need it. I mean, Jesus, you're washing feet. You shouldn't be. I mean, there ought to be one of us, but we didn't want to either. So, uh, no, I'm just going to say mine don't need it. And we don't want to admit that our feet are really dirty or that we need repentance or that we have any sins. Maybe it's because Jesus is too important. And Jesus comes back with, let me cleanse you because you have no share with me if you don't. No koinonia. No part, no union, no fellowship, no participation. Okay, well then that makes it pretty serious if Jesus is saying, you will not be sick without this. You are at all. And we need to be like him in serving, that's true. But they've been part with him. They have been following him. They've been there the whole time. They have learned all the lessons. They've been out preaching. They've done all the things. And so... Peter's kind of confused with this, just like Jesus said. He says, then wash all of me. Wash everything if I can have part with you. Just, just dump it all over me and wash everything. Wash all the parts of me. And he says, no. What do you mean, no? The one clean doesn't need to wash except for his feet. I thought you just told me I needed to be washed. Getting confusing, huh? He says you are clean, but you still need cleansing. You ever felt like that? 
you are clean, but you still need cleansing. You still struggle, but you need to be washed. If it's physical, then your body is clean, but your feet are dirty. And so there's only one part that needs to be washed is that. If it's spiritual, the washing is not about dirty feet. Jesus is not clean, and his feet are not worse than anybody else. It's him. But we are clean because of our following Christ, but there are parts that need to be washed. So we're cleansed first at baptism and our sins are taken away and everything is gone, everything completely gone because there is no judgment, there is no condemnation, we are completely free, there is no guilt, there is no shame anymore, all of it is completely gone. And we're buried with Christ in baptism, we're buried in water blood and sometimes you feel like after a 50 year old salvation You wonder if you need to do it again. You ever felt that? Maybe it, I need that happiness again. I need that joy again. I need that excitement again because I remember what that was like. And that day I felt perfect. I felt like God had forgiven everything. All the burdens had been lifted. Everything had been taken away. And what we're saying is we want to start over. And sometimes we do need washing, but it's just part of us. It is a process of Jesus cleansing us and serving us, and we need to live out repentance and cleansing as we go. And I think Jesus uses this time to teach this because it's not long before they're going to be able to, send out to be sent out to share, and what is it that they're going to do? We wash feet, and that shows compassion. And that's what Jesus is doing. And he says, now I want you to do this for other people, to realize that you can show compassion this way, and to realize that that's what it's all about. It's a process of Jesus cleansing us and serving us, and we model the washing of feet. But it's not really about feet. We think of saved, and there's no further need of any cleansing. And we say that. I mean, you're completely free and clean. The baptism took away every sin that you had. But we know that there's been time since then. And we can either argue with it or we can say, I got dirty feet. I need some cleansing from Jesus. That will be the most powerful thing to the world. When you admit, you still need cleansing for Jesus. And that even though you have been saved and you have been cleansed, and as Jesus puts it to Peter, you are clean. But, I need to wash your feet. Because there are parts of us that are not. We tend to say on the other side of this whole thing that, well... I don't have any sin. I've been baptized. I don't need to repent. I've already been baptized. That baptism has taken away all of my sin, and that's true. And Jesus has never cleansed me again. And that's false. I think with what he's trying to teach here, he's trying to say, you need to have this as a continual time where I cleanse you. And when your feet get dirty, let me wash them. And when you go to someone else, you need to be able to wash them and help them be clean, because this is going to be a continual process for you. He does this with the 11. Judas leaves. 12, really, I guess Judas is still there. Washes his feet, too, even though he knows all you got now is clean feet. But I think the most powerful thing is when we see a people who are repentant people, who realize it's not, I'm saved and you're lost. It's, I'm cleansed by Jesus, and you're cleansed by Jesus. And maybe you need to repent and be baptized into Christ, but I still need this repentance. I still need this cleansing. I still need, because after 50 years, I know there's things that have gone wrong. 
And I know there's things that I've done. And I need this cleansing from Jesus. And he does. And we wash each other's feet. We give forgiveness. We give blessing. And Jesus says, this is what church looks like. A people of repentance. A people where washing takes place because sins can be taken away. We still need that cleansing. And maybe you're there today. Maybe you're there saying, go, well, you know, I need to be baptized first of all because it can take away everything in your life, all sin. Or maybe you're sitting there and going, yeah, I already did that. But I might feel like I need it again. Or I might feel like, well, I'm never doing that again because I've already done that. And now what? Because I know there's parts that need to be cleansed. And Jesus stoops down on a personal level to each one of them and cleanses them. And maybe you need to do that with us this morning so that we can pray with you that God will take away the sin that's in your life. That starts evangelism because if you don't know how to cleanse yourself, how can you share that with somebody else? That's the beginning step. Maybe let's start today with it. Start with us. Would you come while we stand and sing?